Welcome to the Trading Bell. I'm Norgit Kimboy. We've been celebrating women in the International Women's Week, not just day. And we've been reflecting on the role of women in the society, whether we're creating an ample environment for women to, you know, bring out the best in them. We understand that also COVID-19 hit the world. Women were the most affected. So as a country, where do we stand in terms of gender inclusivity? I'm joined by the Cabinet Secretary on Matters Youth Affairs and Gender Affairs and also Public Service, Professor Margaret Copia. Welcome to the show, Prof. Thank you very much, Noah, for having me. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. So let's kick it away. Uh, the, the issue of gender inclusivity. Has there been sort of any affirmative action to make sure that we are having gender inclusivity in our country. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the whole question of gender equality in Kenya, Kenya government takes it very serious. You may also recall uh, sustainable development number five is about gender equality and women empowerment. So coming back to Kenya, we look at our uh, the, the Kenya Vision 2030. It has situated this gender equality as a priority. Mm -hmm. And when we come to our national development plans, we also consider gender, and that's why in the government we have a whole state department of uh, gender affairs. Mm -hmm. This particular month, uh, and in particular 8th of March, we celebrate the International Women's Day. This is where uh, the nation, both men and women, come together to reflect how, what are the gains in gender equality, and what do we still have to not yet done that we could uh, uh, progress. Mm -hmm. Therefore, today I'm here as national security uh, on um, ringing the bell mm -hmm. uh, as they celebrate also the International uh, Women's Day. Okay. Uh, regarding if the government has uh, focused on affirmative action, first let me say why do we have affirmative action on gender equality? You may recall uh, from our history that uh, people are socialized within different roles. Women have different roles, men have different roles. But we know for development to take place in any country, in any organization, in any family, uh, both men and women need to work together. But because of that uh, historical disadvantage or marginalized for women, government has come up with affirmative action to ensure that uh, women get an opportunity mm -hmm. in, in many spheres. Mm -hmm. Let me give an example of affirmative action where, for example, in the parliament, mm -hmm. we, it was decided because leadership and decision making is a very central role in uh, development. Therefore, you cannot have an organization or in a country where leadership is only held by men. But we know when you are going for elective position, it's very difficult for women to compete with men at the equal footing. So what the government has done, we have what we call National uh, Gender Affirmative Act Fund, which supports women who are going for a competitive elective position. Therefore, and also when it comes to education, I think in education we have done very well at primary level, we are parent, girls and boys at the equal level, secondary school, we have also affirmative action where transition rate from standard 80 to form 1 is everybody. And the government has supported that as an affirmative action. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the university, you have seen if the cutoff point for some courses is maybe 69, you may want to do affirmative action, which the government has already done, by lowering one point, especially to marginalized, far-flung areas like the Northeastern, so that the girls can be able to access education. Mm -hmm. Therefore, affirmative action that are already in this country are based on decisions were made, made depending on how women were disadvantaged in the, in the past. Mm -hmm. Remember also affirmative action is not forever. Yes. We have a sunset period, maybe then after 15 years, then women and the girls wouldn't be able, I mean, and boys wouldn't be able to, con to compete on equal footing. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in fact, on a national level, we've seen discussions in regards to inclusivity, 
especially in Parliament, mm -hmm. the two-thirds gender bill coming into Parliament and we see our parliamentarians, mm -hmm. they don't pass it. And uh, coming from the top house in the, you know, in, in the nation, uh, is there any move, uh, you know, from, from maybe your ministry, but uh, as a government in general, to make sure that this two-thirds gender bill is coming to fruition soon? Uh, no, I, you know that uh, in Kenya, we have dealt with the uh, two-thirds gender principle and the tabled in the parliament four times. Mm -hmm. And in the four times, it has not been able to pass, simply because much as we have the affirmative uh, action in the constitution, as there will not be two thans gender principle in the parliament, mm -hmm. but that's one part of the story. But making it happen has been a, a uphill. So what has happened is that uh, every time we have tabled the, the two thans gender bill to go through parliament, we already find a context where majority of members of parliament are men. Therefore, because of that uh, particular, the way people are socialized, they still, even in the parliament, they think women should be able to go in the field there and fight for the position mm -hmm. and come to parliament. Mm -hmm. So, and since you need two thans uh, majority to approve that two thans gender principle, then we have been stuck. Mm -hmm. And you remember the chief justice and said if, if they are not able to pass the two thans gender principle, then the parliament should be dissolved. Mm -hmm. And we also, as a ministry, we kind of engaged, trying to, so even if you dissolved the parliament today, and you send people to have an election, mm -hmm. you'll find still there's no guarantee that we will get two thans uh, gender principle satisfied. Mm -hmm. So we have an hope in the Bonding Bridges Initiative where uh, it, it is already stated, if we go for election today and we do not elect two thans of uh, either gender, then they would have to go and do top up, uh, just as they're doing at the county level. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we do believe in not just a matter of having two thans gender principle in parliament, but it won't as the country stand to gain mm -hmm. when you have an equal parliament, perhaps, uh, we have seen now in the Senate they are going to make it 50-50. Mm -hmm. That means 50 women, 50 men. That is very balanced. Mm -hmm. And we believe that um, the debate, the contributions women will bring on the table will, will actually influence the decision. And uh, for us in the ministry, we, we are convinced that having more women in parliament is what determines the decisions that are made. Take, for example, if they are going to discuss the budget, because we have very many commitments that we make regarding gender equality, but we are not able to deliver because we don't have the budget. Mm -hmm. But if women were sitting in that parliament and 50% of them, they would be able to influence the decision. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So yeah. you, you've mentioned uh, having more women in parliament, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the formulation of the laws, mm -hmm. even budgeting, mm -hmm. it will be influenced. And it, there's always that additional perspective uh, when you have equal representation. And mm -hmm. it brings to discussion the point about gen, uh, gender sensitive budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, historically, as a country, uh, it's not been a discussion. Mm -hmm. But as we move forward, this has to be brought on board. So even bef without achieving that 50-50 gender role, is there elements that we can do to make sure that our budget is gender sensitive? I think as a country, wh when we dis discuss gender, uh, gender budgeting in the budgeting statement, mm -hmm. it's always has been a struggle that uh, we all struggle for resources, but when it comes on the table and we are discussing how do we consider gender in, a, in, in gender maybe programs in a, well, as we are budget because even if you have some decisions you have made and then you don't have budget to support those implementation of those uh, policies mm -hmm. then it becomes a big problem so what we have done uh, as a ministry as a government working very closely with the, the budget office 
we have always said whenever the programs that are gender equality and women empowerment need to be looked at within gender lens yeah. so that you can be able to, to, to say the program that promotes the, the gender equality then need to be funded. Yeah. That we have done through government. We have also worked with the development partners because the government might not fund everything else, but we have lobbied to support gender, uh, gender equality program like uh, training and the development because we also need to train women even if you want them to vie for the position as a member of parliament mm. you need to train them give them that confidence so that they can step out there and offer them there for elective position mm. therefore that has been a journey trying to have gender lens in our budgeting mm. but uh, i think we are better off now than five years ag ago mm. the office of the controller of budget mm works very closely with our State Department of Gender just to ensure when the budget is presented in Parliament, before it is presented, have we kind of uh, uh, examined if gender concerns are factored in. Mm. And we have found it's something we lobby, but I'm happy to say the government has always been, the fact that we have a State Department of Gender, because long time ago we never had a State Department of Gender, mm. gives a voice to be able to lobby for additional funds to support programs on gender equality and women empowerment. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, early on you hinted on devolution, mm -hmm. what is happening in the devolved systems. Mm -hmm. Now we are eight years into you know the devolved systems, the counties. Mm -hmm. They were meant to bring services closer to the people and reach out to the marginalized of which women are categorized and are marginalized. Mm -hmm. And looking at that journey for the eight years, have we made strides on the county level to ensure gender inclusivity? I, I would say that uh, devolution is one of the best uh, things that happened for Kenya. And uh, the fact that uh, devolution is meant to share power and resources up to the county level for the seven counties. So at the national level, uh, where we work around policies and coordination, we, we have a framework, what we call gender sector working group at the national level, and then that is also linked with the county gender sector working framework. Therefore, we have seen uh, the, the, at the county level that there is also department dealing with the gender equality and the women empowerment and we work very closely with the, with the, with the counties just to make sure they get the resources. Their programs are aligned with the, with the, with the Vision 2030 mm -hmm. and the medium term plan so that what is happening at the national level is actually implemented at the ground level. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. As you said, uh, there's still much to be done, yeah, but sure. you have to recognize mm -hmm. the far that we've come. Mm -hmm. And it's not a one person journey. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, collaborative government, private sector, even in our own personal lives, mm -hmm. we take initiative to support women businesses. Mm -hmm. We have women in our families, our mothers, our sisters, yeah, in our neighborhoods. So it's a holistic responsibility. Thank you very much, uh, Madam CS. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Okay. Yeah, so there you have it. Basically, the responsibility and the ball goes back to you. It starts with you. They say that charity begins at home. And in your home, are you empowering the women in that household? That is one. Two, then, we can discuss now on a county level. Is your county government uh, taking an initiative to make uh, that county more gender inclusive and after that we can discuss on a national scale and when you reach the national scale of course we can pinpoint the global scale but the responsibility is ours well thank you very much for that uh, you know for that session right now you want to take a look at the markets shall we
There goes the bell. Tells us that the markets right here have closed and we're going to have a discussion about how the market has been performing. I'm joined by Faith Wangi, Senior Research Analyst at Teleba. Welcome, Faith. Thank you very much. It's good to have you after some long time. It's been some years since I last saw you here. Yes, yes it has been. <laughs> Great. A quick question that I would want to jump into is that there's a lot of excitement right now because mm -hmm. a lot of companies now are looking for, especially the banking sector, looking for yes. releasing the results. Mm -hmm. What have you been observing? Um, there is a lot of excitement to do with what the numbers will have. Um, mm -hmm. We did see quite a bit of heat in terms of uh, loan loss provisioning in March of uh, 2020. Yeah. So if people are waiting to see what will be the final result um, mm -hmm. as we now get into the new year. Again, full year results are also tied to the upcoming first quarter results. So people are also looking forward to commentary on that, yeah. what banks think uh, their first quarter has been like. So it's dual fold. Okay, and I'm sure a lot of the stocks which you shall be looking at are getting excited there. Yes. Now, there's of course a lot of questions on uh, the depreciation that we are facing, whether we're going further to depreciate. <laughs> I don't know from where you sit in, what you're observing as well? Uh, there'll still be likely further depreciation on the currency. Okay. Again, our currency reserves are reducing. Um, commodity prices are still yet to pick up as strongly as we would like them. Mm -hmm. So even our, our ability to also generate forex uh, income is also uh, reducing. So that's also still uh, uh, taking a major hit on the currency. So we would, we would expect some slight depreciation continually over the coming year. Okay. You know, off the cuff, we have seen a lot of activity that has been happening. Uh, but I think this second wave, the president announced that no more activity that uh, was a little bit endangering Kenyans. Mm -hmm. But from where you see it as well, COVID is here, second wave sort of come in here. Locally, have you seen any effects that, uh, that are going around? Uh, the effect has mainly been on the entertainment industry, on hotel industry, yes. which has been unable to go back to uh, performing at full capacity. Mm -hmm. So that has been the major hit, uh, which has impacted their ability to actually generate business revenue and again tax revenue as well. So that has been the major hit to uh, the overall economy and also continued lockdowns in the market. Um, okay. So there's still fears that we might go back to a time when we'll actually have a more stringent curfew. I yeah. hope that does not happen, but there's likelihood of that as well. A lot of resilience needed right now, especially in those industries that you've mentioned. All right, Faith, let's go to the shilling now. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, we're still struggling here and there. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's your observation generally on how we are faring on. Uh, we are facing a continued depreciation, and mm -hmm. I do think that will continue uh, going going into the year. Again, uh, there is uh, weakening commodity prices. We've yes. seen our, 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 our tea mm -hmm. our volumes. We've also seen horticultural products are not selling as much as they used to last year. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we have consumers looking more to goods that they actually need as opposed to goods yeah. that we sell, which are mostly luxury, uh, like horticultural goods, mm -hmm. then we are seeing prices coming down. So our ability to generate forex income is still reducing. Yeah. So we are in a space where we are seeing some bit of depreciation and I do think we'll actually end up at a spot where our imports become very expensive. The most recent conversation has been the fuel prices. Yeah. So as our imports become more expensive, it does uh, weaken our ability to actually And certainly I don't want to just brush it off because there is a lot of April right now. Yes. I mean, this is a serious spike. Mm -hmm. What is it doing to us? <laughs> Wow, uh, it will increase the cost of living definitely uh, because our, co our fuel prices are dictated overall by one, the taxes that we have with government, which are mainly stable, mm -hmm. and secondly, uh, the crude oil prices, which have been increasing strongly over the past, let's say, three, four months. Yeah. So that means the fuel price is actually going to keep going higher over the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. So do expect the repercussions of fuel prices. It's what is used for cooking. It's what is used for industry as well. So the fuel prices going up do mean the prices of products will now start creeping up slowly over the next couple of months. So I'd say inflation is on its way up. So we brace ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's get to the statistics, actually. And uh, I have seen a little bit of some excitement here mm -hmm. uh, from the top gainers, top losers. Uh, one of the key interest ones that I see is Equity Group Holdings. Uh, that is among the top gainers being a blue chip company amongst the rest. Mm -hmm. Do you have a comment on this? Uh, equity is also uh, one of the banks that's about to re release results either this week or next week. Mm -hmm. And so investors are looking forward to whether they'll pay dividend. Um, yes. I think the president was set by Stanbic Bank, yeah. which managed to pay dividends, and Equity Bank being better capitalized. Yeah. And also the fact that they didn't pay a dividend last year. Investors are looking forward to perhaps a dividend um, okay. with Equity Bank and also to see what their comment will be uh, going forward given the funding that they have acquired just over the last three months. Okay. I, I want to skip the top losers part and just jump into the movers, first mm -hmm. of all. 
Uh, we can see Safaricom, Britam, KCB, Equity, as well. And I think you've mentioned about Equity Holdings and EABL. You comment on Safaricom? Um, Safaricom, I guess, uh, was, uh, there was a bit of excitement uh, on buying into the stock, but I think attention has moved to the banking sector. Okay. So there has been a bit of slowdown in uh, the price of Safaricom as well, yeah. as investors now move to the next exciting stocks, which would be <laughs> banks at the moment. Okay. I'm sure I'll be asking you later on about what stock to check in here, but your comment as well on Britam Holdings, it's among the top movers as well. Um, Britam Holdings has uh, recently announced they are doing a restructuring program. Yeah. So there are some investors who are positive about that, some are negative about that. So mm -hmm. obviously there will be a change in investor hands uh, during this particular time mm -hmm. as they draw closer to closing their um, voluntary retrenchment, which was meant to close uh, somewhere in March. Okay, okay. KCB Group and Equity, <laughs> I see banks there now. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, so banks as well. KCB was also meant to re release results sometime this week or next week. Yeah. So we are looking forward to the numbers that they'll post. Again, investors are still looking out for perhaps a dividend, considering that KCB actually paid a dividend last year. Mm -hmm. Despite what we saw with COVID, they're still very well capitalized. So investors are looking forward to both the commentary on the coming year and also whether they'll get some dividend. Great. Okay, let me jump in into the indices. Uh, when I look at the all share index, there's mm -hmm. a little bit of movement uh, from the previous looks of the previous weeks. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether there's a comment on that from your end as well. Um, overall, we've seen uh, the major blue chip companies uh, pick up again, uh, one because of results. Um, Safaricom has also been doing very well in terms of their business franchise. And also we've seen the general economic environment pick up over the last uh, couple of months. So there has been an appreciation of that in the market. Okay. So I would say that has been driving indices so far. Great, and we certainly hope it will keep on going up. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> Great time now for Markets 101. So on Markets 101, we get to learn about dividends. What are they and how do they work? Faith, over to you. Could you help us understand this? Yes. Okay. So dividends is uh, once a company makes profits, it decides a percentage of that profit will go back to the shareholders. Yeah. So shareholders are people who have invested in the stock and have bought some portion of the company. Yeah. So the dividend, which is a part of the profits, will be apportioned to every shareholder as per their shareholding. So for example, if you've bought 100 shares in, say, KCB, and they will be issuing a, 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 a dividend of two shillings per share, yeah. then it means for all your 100 shares, you will yeah. actually get two shillings for each and every share wow. that you hold. Okay. So making it uh, that you have a bit of money in your pocket because yes. you invested so it also depends on the company and how much profit they've made if you haven't started investing then now you've got your tip there <laughs> that if your company is doing well of course your pocket will be doing well as well because of the dividends let's now cross over to my favorite part which is the questions that you've sent to us Kaylee is asking how are stocks taxed how are stocks taxed over to you Faye so a stock, so let's pick an example of, let's say, Safaricom. So yeah. Safaricom has corporate taxes that it pays. So this is on its product. So, uh, for example, M-Pesa, every transaction is actually taxed. Safaricom pays a tax. Mm -hmm. uh, Safaricom also pays tax to, the, uh, to KRE through profits. So they are also taxed on profits. Yeah. When you as a shareholder buy Safaricom shares, mm -hmm. that transaction is taxed at the brokerage level. Yeah. And then finally, for you as a, a, a shareholder, whenever your dividends are paid to you, mm -hmm. they'll always deduct a withholding tax. So there are several steps to how an overall company is taxed by the time they're actually being uh, able to give you uh, any form of dividend. All right. Of course, that explains why there's always those markups anytime you're trading, is it? Yes, yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, then Juliet Koi. Juliet Koi on Facebook is asking, is mm. selling land by, to buy treasury bills or bonds worth it? That's an interesting question. It is an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. And I'd say that it's a layered question yeah. because uh, land gives you capital gain. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, if you're owning land, then you're intending to use it productively either in future yeah. or to sell it in future. But in between, mm -hmm. it doesn't give you any income. Yeah. However, if you are a person who needs the periodic income every so often, mm -hmm. and let's say, for example, if you are a retiree at that point in time, mm -hmm. or you need some funding in between, then treasury bills will work for you. Okay. Because that way, once you buy a treasury bill mm -hmm. or a bond, then yeah. government is able to give you a certain income that is steady every um, 
depending on what you buy. So if you buy a biannual bond, you get an income every six months. Yeah. If you buy a T-bill that's running for a year, you get an income every year. Mm -hmm. If you buy a T-bill that's running for six months, you get your income after six months. Yeah. So it depends on what your goal is. So the All thing right. with treasury bills is that they do not have a capital gain per se, mm -hmm. um, unless you're buying bonds, which is also a, a bit of a longer discussion in terms yeah. of how that is calculated, because it means you have to trade out your bond. Yeah. But they do not have a capital gain per se. So this is for specifically for treasury bills. Yeah. Bonds do have a capital gain, but mm -hmm. also that's depending on the market. Yeah. So depending on what your goal is, um, it depends on whether you'll sell or whether you'll buy. So there's certainly a need for some lessons for Koi to get to learn about even what bonds to invest on before you just purchase, is it? Well, not quite, because bonds are secure. Yeah. Um, they are guaranteed by government, yeah. so it's, it's highly unlikely that government will default on payments. <laughs> but I'm talking about some of them are mm -hmm. taxed differently, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. So some are tax-free, some do have a tax element on them. So yes, there's a, there's a slight difference. Yeah, I'm trying to make Koi save some money. <laughs> Great. All right, all right. Thanks so much for those questions that you have sent us as well. We keep urging you to, you know, send them as many. We will try as much as we can to help you get to understand any terminologies, any questions that you may have to make you a better investor. Thanks, Faith, for joining us and, of course, helping us with the numbers. You're welcome. Great. There you have it right here on the Trading Bell Show. And remember to always give us your feedback on the numbers and social media handles appearing at the bottom end of your screen. From us right here is bye-bye. Brace yourselves as Faith has told us. It's a bit of tough times. Fuel prices up and we certainly hope for the best. For now it's bye-bye. See you. Keep it trading well.